Well, welcome to At The Table with AACC or the Asian American Christian Collaborative. Uh, At The Table is a series of roundtable discussions uh, where the Asian American Christian pastor or leader uh, is able to draw from their experiences, uh, their education and their expertise uh, to discuss questions and topics and issues that impact the Asian American Christian community and the church at large. Uh, my name is Ray Chang, as uh, I hope you know by now, uh, and I get to serve as the president of the Asian American Christian Collaborative. And we're here today at the historic Chinese Community Church of Washington, D.C., uh, located in the heart of Chinatown in our nation's capital. Uh, the church was founded in eight, uh, 1935 and is the only Chinese church in D.C. proper. We're going to be talking today about cross-racial dynamics and the minority experience in pursuing unity in the midst of diversity. I'm so glad to be with uh, each of you uh, and uh, excited to kind of share a little bit about you. So uh, glad you're here, Dan. Uh, Dan, you serve as the, the lead pastor of the Village Church in Baltimore, and so great to have you here. Steve, you serve as the executive director and the founder of Little Lights, which is in Washington, D.C., uh, which really serves uh, the, uh, the underserved community. Uh, and you namely, primarily work with uh, African-American uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, youth, uh, from what I, from our, yeah, youth and families. Yeah, youth and, families. and then uh, with Joey Barnett, uh, who is a teaching faculty in psychology at the University of Maryland. It's great to have you all here. All right, thanks. thanks. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to just dive in with a couple of questions. All of us have navigated racially diverse environments. Uh, I'm not sure what your uh, your, your like your everyday uh, experience is, uh, Dan, but I know that you serve in a predominantly multi-ethnic church, and you've been a part of that for a long time. And and you know the Baltimore area is a is a different. It seems like a different dynamic, especially for being an Asian American. You serve in a predominantly African American neighborhood that's been kind of shifting its demographics in a significant way. And then, you know, you've worked in uh, predominantly white uh, conservative uh, organizations uh, and they're now at a uh, university teaching as a faculty member uh, on, on some very important things. And so, how has navigating those in navigating racially diverse environments, and maybe you can share a little bit more to kind of give a little more texture and color to uh, to your experiences. How's that impacted your understanding of yourself, the church, and of God? Well, I think for me, um, part of my passion for uh, cross-racial ministry reconciliation is just an outflow of my own story where uh, I think I've shared in different places where uh, it just had a lot of anger um, and expressed itself in violence, especially I think racially and some of it. And my therapist has been doing getting, putting their kids through college through my journey. But uh, <laughs> just a lot of, uh, I think, abuse I'd received growing up as an Asian American and not really liking it. And when I got bigger, I realized I was bigger and I could take care of it. So expressed in a lot of violence, especially racially. So I think when the Lord did work in my life, some of the conviction, and even now when I share how I know God is real, is he sh changed my heart from one that hated other people to now I just have this, it's not driven from me because I'm not that good, but desire to be in family with those who might come from very different contexts for me. So I think um, that was the start, but now continuing to walk in some of that ministry of reconciliation, it's not always easy, and I know we're gonna get into that, but it draws out of my heart my need continually for Jesus. So for me, I'm probably being a little self-centered. It helps me to draw close to the Lord. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, my background definitely played a big part in having a passion for this. Like moving from Korea to Houston, Texas, when I was younger, and and uh, also experiencing you know racism in in the South in the late '70s, early '80s. Um, but then you know I became an atheist in high school and college but then had a pretty dramatic conversion after, after college where I had a lot of experience of compassion. And you know, when I became a Christian, I was like really filled with like the love of God and the compassion of God. And I thought, oh, you know, uh, God loves all people. God loves those who are on the margins. Um, but then, you know, as a, becoming a Christian and then walking into church congregations, one, realizing just how racially segregated most church congregations are. And you know, as somebody who was a you know secular person like coming into churches, um, just feeling like othered in a way when I would walk into certain congregations, just feeling, just even by the way I was treated, even non-verbally, just feeling, uh, you know, less humanized sometimes than in than in spaces where I was among like agnostics and atheists, and you know, just really felt that at an experiential level, like oh, the church is actually really 
behind even secular settings when it comes to race, race relations and racial dynamics. And that just uh, grieved me because when I became a Christian, I was so excited about the message of Christianity and, and message of Christ's teaching and just radical compassion and unity. And, and then having the ex experience of going to church congregations or church settings where it was kind of the opposite, felt like it was sort of the opposite of that. So it's always been a passion, I think, since I became a Christian, like we need to, we need to live out these teachings of unity and compassion um, and justice, um, you know, if we're gonna have credibility in society. So that's definitely part of my passion. Yeah, I can resonate with a lot of what has been said. Uh, you know, I grew up in a uh, you know very diverse area, actually not far from here in uh, Maryland. And uh, you know, becoming a Christian in college, um, it was definitely eye-opening. You know, to see, as you were saying earlier, just how segregated you know churches, right? You know, it's usually it's usually said that you know the most segregated hour, you know in the whole week is is church time right you know 10 or 11 o'clock you know and um i definitely noticed that you know when i was you know when i was participating in um you know i guess more conservative evangelical um circles you know um so you know i i know when i when i read scripture you know um i see a god who who cares about this issue you know i see a god who um, abhors racism, you know. Um, but as you were saying earlier, you know, it, it does seem like in some pockets in the church, you know, we are almost behind in a way. We are almost behind secular culture in a way. And um, it makes it difficult, I think, um, to even broach certain topics, you know, in the church at large, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I want to press in a little bit more. Like, how, how have those experiences, I mean, you, you kind of said that it led you to hate, you know? And so, like, that's a really powerful word. And then you met Christ in a new way, and then that transformed you. Are there other ways that kind of some of the difficult cross-racial dynamics impacted your kind of understanding of yourself and of God? I mean, I, you know, I serve every day uh, primarily in an African American community and you know um, and lived you know for many years in a predominantly African American community um, and so it's something I just it's just part of my e everyday life is just being often like a, a stark minority in almost any setting that I go to um, but I think that's part of the reason I created little I just like because uh, I was so passionate about unity in the, in the body of Christ. It's like, I wanted to care for these kids that I was meeting in this low-income neighborhood, but also wanted to just have the experience of like diverse fellowship and crossing racial lines and class lines as well. And I've gained so much richness, and, um, but it's also like challenging in a good way too, like on a daily basis. Like you can never be like totally comfortable. Um, and, but I, I think ever since I became a Christian, I realized that like most Christian growth happens in settings that aren't too comfortable, right? And so kind of almost always being in an uncomfortable environment where I'm, I'm the minority, I, you know, I'm like, even at like ministry meetings in the city, I'm usually the only Asian American um, in a room full of, you know, African Americans or African Americans and whites. And, um, but I, was just, I also felt like the teachings of Jesus are so radical and I wanna experience what it's like, even a taste of what that, that real unity looks like. And so uh, I, I know I've just gained a lot from crossing racial boundaries and I want other people to experience that. And it's been great to see other people experience it and gain a lot from it. Yeah, I know for, um probably what moved me along some of those directions, especially in leadership, was in our churches, I think in really good ways, we would talk and encourage our people, be on mission and love your neighbor and love your people at work. But then there would be this disconnect when we would talk about, well, I, 
I can't really invite, and this is when I was in predominantly Korean or Asian, Pan-Asian churches, I can't really invite people from work here because they're going to stick out. It's going to be strange. And, and again, even I think in my um, understanding of reconciliation churches, I think it's grown from there. But that was, and I think still a valid point that kind of moved. There's got to be a better connect between how we talk about living within our communities, but then our churches seem so siloed off from that. But I think kind of really similar to what Steve was talking about was um, in terms of one of the ways even in our church we talk about how we grow, um, where discipleship is often a really, in some of our tribes, a very heady thing, like reading a book, and this is how you get discipled, learning all these principles, all really great. But in our church, we've talked a lot about how that discomfort from being with people who might not align with you fully in different ways that's one of the most powerful ways God works in you. So I think I'm ripping off Dr. Carl Ellis or someone else I've heard in different ways, but that whole 75% rule of how in a church with different representative populations, there's got to be enough that you have unity with. And, you know, we're not talking about core doctrinal matters, but there's enough, about 25% that you don't really fully align with people, but that's healthy for you. That's good. That's part of your formation to also be... Um, reminded not everything is supposed to be about you, but that's kind of the path of Christ. So in our church, for instance, we encourage people who are feeling some of that tension of, you know, the way we sing that song, I can't even clap to it. I don't know. <laughs> but that's a good thing. That's good for you. And that's going to invite you into the presence of Christ. And that's been some of my journey, because in our earlier years, we were one of the few Asian Americans in our own church. And I would sometimes ask myself, I don't even feel at home in my own church. What's going on? But the Lord was inviting me into the path of following Him through that. And what were the what were the racial make? What was the racial makeup of that church? Well, that earlier on, uh, we were majority Anglo, um, but we were very multicultural because it was a mix of more upwardly mobile professionals. But then people, from, we were one of the few neighborhoods in Baltimore that was predominantly white, but a lot of the same issues that you would identify with challenges in the city, addictions, family, but, but it was just among white people. So we were a diverse white population, and then a few Asians, uh, a few black and brown communities as well, but mostly that. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I don't know, I sometimes feel cognitive dissonance almost, because I think on one hand, you know, we read, um, you know, in history about um, amazing, amazing figures, you know, um, figures that have fought for racial justice, you know, Martin Luther King, um, for instance, who was motivated, was very motivated, you know, by his faith, right? He internalized um, the teachings of Jesus in, um, try in fighting for racial justice, like, his, you know, Christ's teachings are, are what motivated, or part of what motivated him to um, seek for justice, seek for racial justice. But then you almost see, then the dissonance comes in, because like you almost see in certain contexts, right, in, kind of in some of the contexts that I've, that I've been involved with, that I've seen, where it's almost like the opposite. It's almost like, no, we don't want to uh, fight, fight for justice, or we don't want to um, emphasize those things. So um, I, I guess for me, you know, I really um, need to, I, I need to rest on, the teachings of Christ. You know, I need to rest on the teachings of Christ and of the scriptures and um, of God who, you know, does emphasize, um, you know, the fact that, um, you know, racial reconciliation is something that is biblical. Justice is certainly a biblical concept and theme, and it is right to do what is right. It is right to fight for what is right. And I think kind of related to that, I think sometimes I could be totally wrong and I, I got to be humble enough to recognize I could be totally wack. Well, what right? if you're partially wrong? <laughs> partially wrong. But sometimes I think I know maybe I'm on the right path is I think I use the same approach to scripture and I try to drive everything from my interpretation of scripture and everything else. And most people say, cool. But I, I noticed when I would talk about race, we're using the same hermeneutic and approach. It'd be like, you're liberal, you're crazy. I would have, I, get, I used to get so much hate mail. Like, I feel sorry for your church, you know, being led by a false shepherd and all. I'm like, okay, I'm using the same approach. And I think recognizing certain idols when we talk about race, there's a reason why people get so riled up in our nation. 
because there is a fundamental brokenness when it comes to the area. And all the more conversations like this are critical because I think if we don't, we're losing a key component of what it means to be the people of Christ represented. And it's probably some false idols are being smashed there as we're engaging in this. Yeah, no, that's right. And I mean, you kind of mentioned dissonance. You call, you're talking about idolatry. I think uh, intuitively to a lot of Asian American communities and individuals, you know, we, there is a, a high value of harmony, right? I mean, we're, we are highly relational. And even like within the Korean American population, with, within the Korean language, how we call our aunts and uncles is through relationship. You are my father's sister. My, and you know, like you're my father's third sister. and there are specific words that kind of show us how we are related to people and what we call them according to how we are related to them. That's one piece, so that there's an orientation towards relationship. And everybody's related, oriented towards relationship, but there's a, there's a unique texture to our orientation to relationship as well as our unique kind of emphasis on harmony. And there are lots of reasons for that. That fuels, in some ways, our instincts to drive towards unity in a lot of ways. And, and on the negative side, we, we think when there's no conflict or tension, that means there's unity, and that's a problem. On the other side, because of our orientation towards harmony, we want to constantly restore and repair what's been broken. And mostly because we want to kind of reconnect that has been, dis with, that has been detached and then make sure that the relationship is right with one another. That means that we have a natural disposition and inclination, uh, not just as Christians, but also as Asian Americans towards unity. And we also have some like uh, culturally informed uh, tools that allow us to do that. On the other hand, we live in a diverse world, right? Diversity is, is a fact, it's a reality. It's, it's not going anywhere. I mean, the fact that there are different that there are there there is biodiversity in in God's creation. That that there are men and there are women and there are children and there are elders. That that, that changes the dynamic of how we navigate the world. That there are different ethnicities and languages and peoples and tribes. That changes the way that we navigate the world. Diversity is a fact. Unity is something that we're called to. But diversity often makes unity difficult. And so how do you think through that, especially when it comes to race, especially as Asian Americans? Um, and how do you navigate the tension between unity and diversity in light of all that we're talking about? Yeah, I think for me, it's really d trying to define what unity actually is, right? Because in some contexts, like, people see unity as like conformity, right? Like, as long as you conform to these norms, or you, can, you know, then we can have unity. But for, let's say, a lot of people of color, you may have to give up a lot of your identity in order to kind of get along and to fit in. And, um, and so I think even among Asian Americans, it can, there can be a lot of pressure to conform to to something so that everybody gets along, but to the detriment of people's well, personal well-being or, or, uh, or spiritual growth. Like, um, I mean, for, for me, we have to also understand as Asian Americans, like, you know, when we, our families came here, we came into a very particular historical context. Like, there's history in all these group relationships between African Americans and whites and whites and a Asian Americans. There's a, there's a, and in many ways it's very toxic. We've had a toxic history of race relations in the United States and history of oppression, right, based on race. And so, but we don't get a lot of education on the context that we're currently in. Like, we're not in a vacuum. Um, there's a historical context that we find ourselves and we're trying to navigate without a lot of resources. Because like you guys said, even in churches, but e even in schools, we get very little education and very, historical, very little historical context on where we find ourselves and what we're actually trying to navigate. So I think that's a big part of the problem is 
as a country, as, as church institutions, we really haven't reckoned with the history to say how did we get to this very dysfunctional place that we find ourselves so that we can try to find ways out of it. Just like your therapist needs to learn about you, right, and to learn about your context and your history to try to help you figure out what it is to become a more functional person and less dysfunctional. In the same way, I think as a nation and in our church institutions, we have to understand how we got to these dysfunctions in order to confront it and to, to make things right, like you said, to repair so that we can find a healthier way forward. But the unwillingness to talk about the dysfunction, unwillingness to talk about how we got here, is itself a sign of the dysfunction. So, you know, I think we have to understand that we're in a very particular historical context and really confront those issues if we're going to get better. I think we can um, value both unity and diversity, you know, at the same time, and I think we should, you know. Um, you know, I think diversity um, makes us stronger, you know. I think, um, you know, everyone brings a different perspective, you know, when I'm teaching, um, when I'm teaching in the classroom, you know, when I'm teaching at, um, at my university, and I'm teaching about a specific topic, you know, in psychology, you know. Some of my students that come from different backgrounds than I do, they come with different perspectives, perspectives that I may not have thought about, right? Perspectives that I may not have um, pondered. So I don't think, um, you know, diversity is, is the problem, you know. Um, sometimes in, um, con in contexts that I've been a part of, um, people will cite, um, you know, the verse in Galatians where it says, you know, we're all one in Christ. And so it's a great verse. It's a, it's a beautiful verse. Um, but sometimes people will cite that verse and then say, oh, well, there's, see, there's no such, there's not really any such thing as ethnicity, you know, or, or race. Um, but I think that's taking that verse um, a little out of context, right? Um, at the same time, we should value unity. You know, we should value um, unity um, in Christ, you know, as, as, as it says in Galatians. We should value um, unity in our mission, you know, to um, love God and, and to, to do justice, to do what is right, um, to fight oppression, you know. Um, so I, I think we should value both, you know. And I th in a lot of ways, I think we, we, we can believe multiple things at the same time. I think that's just yeah. a hard thing for especially sometimes our Christian tribes in our world where we always want to strive to be people who are pursuing unity because that's expressing the goodness of what Jesus has done to bring together people. Um, but I think sometimes we misinterpret unity as just any absence of conflict at all, which is just wrong. And we don't do that with any other area of sin. Like we would, if a church would just say, well, for the sake of unity, we're not gonna talk about people's sin right there. We don't do that for any other, well, at least a healthy church. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to race or those men, we're like, well, let's not talk about that because that's gonna break the unity. But we wanna have a hope for a better version of who we're supposed to be. And to do that, even to be a peacemaker doesn't mean that there's not gonna be a tension. I think sometimes we have an a inappropriate understanding of peacemaking. It's actually sometimes getting into really hard stuff because you love people so much, because you want them to be better than they are right now, and because maybe it's sin, maybe it's not, but we see something that could be better. We need to get into that for the sake of being a whole people. But that's going to involve tension. So unity plus the diversity, but it's not going to be... It's, there's probably going to be some complications as we move towards that goal. Yeah, that's good. Now, Steve, you alluded to this, but you know, one of the things that you said we need to do is uh, we actually have to define unity. So how would you, in a very just short response, how would you define Christian unity? What is it actually? And what isn't it, maybe? <laughs> I mean, for me, you know, I look at like passages like John 17 about just having that oneness Right? And to me, oneness is really about a deep level of empathy, really um, trying to understand uh, and empathize and have compassion for other people's pain and uh, other people's perspectives, other people's uh, experiences. Um, 
So for me, part of it is a deep level of empathy and deep level of like, even if you can't fully understand others, you, um, you do your best to try to see what their perspective is and respect other people's uh, perspectives and, and experiences. And so to me, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot about unity that requires respect, that you have to respect other people's experiences, even if it differs from yours, and to learn from other people uh, different perspectives and experiences. And um, so to me, experience, I mean, uh, unity starts with respect, but also requires a deep level of empathy uh, for one another. So it's not just like an ideological thing. It, to me, it has to be experiential and um, at, a, at a deeper level, spiritually and emo emotionally. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, I don't <laughs> it is. It's really good. I don't, I was a really good definition. Yeah, I don't have much to add other than I think um, a posture, adopting a posture where we really, um, we really say to ourselves, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to um, be empathetic, like you said, you know, I'm really going to try to see where people are coming from, you know, and if we all did that, you know, the world would look a lot different, I think, if we all really um, kind of had that posture of, of humility, you know, I, I think, um, you know, definitely I think humility comes to mind, you know, having a, a posture um, that says, you know, I don't know everything um, about everything, I don't know everything about you, you know, as an individual, because you, um, you come from, um, everyone comes from um, different backgrounds and, and different perspectives. Um, so I think a step towards unity would actually be having that humility to say that and to say like, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna assume, you know, something about you. And that's actually, you know, the, when we teach psychology, you know, we talk about, um, you know, stereotypes and, and, and prejudice and, and racism, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of that, um, well, racism, it starts from assumptions, right? It starts from um, assumptions about someone, right? And uh, I think, um, you know, in the spirit of unity, you know, we really have to be people that are humble enough to not make those assumptions, right, about people, so. That's really good, and I, I just one thing to add on with that is, obviously we should work towards expressions of unity, and, and that's what we're trying to do, but also for me, one thing I continue to try to come back to is living in what Christ has already made for us. Like, you know, as we go through the epistles and other places, like for those who are his church, um, you already have a commonality. You've obviously gotten away from it. So what do we need to do to remember the unity that we have and, and start from what God has done amongst his people? And as a matter of discipleship, we got to help people to understand this is part of your growth in Christ. Remember, you are already one in Jesus. If you're family, you might look very different. You might even believe some very differing things, but you got to come back to what you've been purchased to be together in one unified whole. That's good. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can say you are truly unified unless you know how to navigate the diversity in your midst. And, and that, especially as more diversity enters into the community. And so that's all good. Now, each of you are Asian American from what I understand. <laughs> unless, <laughs> speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, yeah, obviously, you know, uh, the, the, the representation here of Asian America is very limited. I, I don't know what your ethnic background is. Chinese. Okay, so you're Chinese, and then we're all Korean. And so it's limited to two countries um, <laughs> out of the many, many countries. And so we're, we're approaching things uh, in a different way, in a unique way, especially as we kind of say, art articulating our Asian American experience. Um, but what, were, what, do you, what would you say are some of the unique dynamics that, and, and, and experiences that you face as Asian Americans in this kind of journey, effort, endeavor to pursue unity in the midst of a cross-racial or multiracial diversity. Can you ref rephrase it a little bit? Like, uh, yeah, like what, how does your Asian Americanness get impacted or shaped or influenced or influences your experience of pursuing unity in a kind of multiracial diversity or in the context that you're in? 
I think at least for me and some of the experience I've had, um, I think Asian Americans, many I've met, are actually really prone towards unity and wanting, even in the name of assimilation, really good at fitting in in different places. So I think unity in one sense comes almost naturally. I think the challenge, and something I've been trying to encourage other, other folks as well, is fight for unity, but don't lose the distinctiveness of how God has wired you to be as part of the unified whole. Like, you are gonna add something to the unity of God's people that's necessary, it's beautiful, it's important, and it might be something missing without your presence there. So unity, but again, not dismissing some of the unique differences that you'll bring as an Asian American with your history, with your background, with your culture, and, and to be unified in others with that. Yeah, I mean, I think, one, I think it's important for us to understand what race is, right? And so, you know, at Little Lights, we, you know, we created a curriculum that's geared toward Christians to help people understand, like, even some of the history of racial ideology. That, one, that race is a social construct, and really understanding, like, what that means, like, and, and how race was constructed. And so, for instance, like for, for Asian Americans, right, none of us, you know, I was born in Korea, nobody in Asia identifies themselves as Asian. Like if you're living in Korea, you're not saying, I'm Asian, right? You say, I'm Korean. Or if you're living in China, you don't say, I'm Asian. I'm in. It's only when we come to the United States in the, our racialized context are we then put into a category called Asian and Asian American and we have to one, understand, try to like absorb that and to, to react to that and react to our environment because you know, the four of us, if we walk into most public spaces in America, are all gonna be considered the same, regardless of like what nationality we, we, we came from. And so I think we have to understand like how racialized our society is. The country that we have walked into or we are born into is very racialized and understanding even what that even means and, and how it was socially constructed. Uh, and so for me, fighting for unity is definitely about fighting for, for justice. And I think we can't have justice unless there's that historical repair of damage done, as well as the sharing of power. So. You, you can have like a diverse congregation, but if all the power of a denomination or a church are within one racial group, you're not really gonna have unity because it's not a, a, a proper shared use of power, right? You're not gonna, because the word, you know, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And shalom is a much deeper word than just an absence of conflict, right? It's, it's this flourishing at all levels, right? At individually and as a, as a group. And you can't have this total flourishing without justice. And you can't have justice unless there's repair and unless there's a sharing of power. So I think we have to look beyond the photo op, right? A lot of times we sort of see unity as like people taking pictures together you know, across the racial lines and eating, the, you know, having a barbecue, you know, and you take the, and it's on like every website of like, even if a church isn't particularly diverse, they want to, you, you know, many churches, you know, yeah, want to put. It's that hand, all the different colored hands in a circle. <laughs> and you know, oftentimes like, if you're like the token Asian in a congregation, you might be in a lot of like marketing material because like they want to show that the church is diverse or whatever. To me, that's not unity. That is some level of like micro diversity which is good in itself, but it's not unity to me. I think unity, you have to share power, and it's really about where, where is power is held and how is it shared, and is there unity and harmony at that level, even if it's, even if it's sort of in the background to me. So I think you have to go deeper if you're talking about true unity, true shalom. That's good. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, something you said earlier, you know, kind of made me think about how um, you know, as an Asian, as an Asian American, and I, I, I identify as Asian American, I'm mixed race really, um, you know, but, um, you know, in a lot of contexts that I've been a part of, um, you know, because I'm Asian American and usually one of the only Asian Americans in that specific church context or, or uh, faith community context, 
I'm sometimes almost treated as if I'm like the spokesperson, right, <laughs> for for um, all Asian issues. And and kind of as you were saying earlier, I mean, Asians a very it's a very broad category. It's a racial category. It's very broad. You know, um, there are many. Um, countries, many ethnicities that are encompassed within the term Asian. So I think, um, yeah, ed educating people ab about that I think is important because I think a lot of people don't actually understand like that distinction, you know. Um, so yeah, that's good. Yeah, it made me think, man, that was such a powerful word. Um, so confession time here. <laughs> one, of, one of our church values, and these are old values, is actually uni uh, united diversity. And I believe in the concept, but actually I'm, I haven't been using the word diversity in our church anymore for those exact reasons, because I think especially among, uh, depending on your background, that can be almost a way to excuse with the very representative surface looking group, oh yeah, we're, we're doing it, when there's actually not power being shared. There's actually not empowerment of voices that have not been given that that, that platform before. And so for our church, we're actually revisiting how do we communicate better biblical reconciliation, which is more than just kind of the photo op. It's gotta go deeper than that. So that's my confession time, especially if, if you go on our church website, if it looks, you know, we're, we're trying to work with that. <laughs> He's like on Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, this, this person's too dark, this person's too light. Let's, let's, yeah. um, well, I mean, let's, let's end with this. Um, what are some of the greatest hurdles to unity as an Asian American in a multiracial context? And what do you think needs to happen in order for um, Asian Americans to be able to fully participate in life, in communal life, as well as um, kind of uh, pr pursue and enact and, and embody the type of unity within the communities that they're a part of. Maybe if I could, um, one of the, maybe it's not as much now with some of the cultural changes, but one of the questions I used to get a lot from leaders of Asian, predominantly Asian church was like, how can we get more diverse? Mm. Or how can we grow to attract? And you know, I could give some tips, but more and more, um, I've been saying, I don't know if the goal of every church has to be within your local church, like representative of every people. You shouldn't be closed off from people coming in, mm -hmm. but more, what would it look like for have, us to have a vision to be able to pursue some of these efforts, but doesn't have to be within our individual church, but moving beyond even different barriers, even across denominations or, or across city lines and partnering uh, for whether it's gatherings or service efforts or things where we're expressing reconciliation, but it doesn't have to be within some of the narrow means we said, because I think there's a lot of shame or guilt sometimes attached to churches that are mono-ethnic. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we're not as faithful or what's wrong with us? Why aren't we drawing in? I'm like, I don't think there has to be shame there, but there can be an invitation into creatively looking in other ways. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm thinking big, big picture again, but like, I think because, I mean, in our, in our crowd that we're speaking to is predominantly evangelical, right? Or majority evangelical, the audience that we're addressing. And I think for Asian Americans, I mean, we typically are, have been trained or influenced or in denominations that are white and evangelical, right? And I think what Asian Americans need to do is one, like question some of the things that we've learned from white evangelicalism and learn how to critique white evangelicalism. Because white evangelicalism itself has a particular history, has a particular cultural context that it came out of. And, it, and white evangelicalism has come out of, um, come out of a history that included capitulating to slavery and s Jim Crow segregation and et cetera. So there's been moral compromises within the white evangelical tradition that has to be addressed and corrected. And we can't just take it in wholesale. So I think one thing Asian Americans need to do, and which may go, go against our culture, is to confront and critique what has been authority to us um, and not equate our seminary professors and 
uh, white evangelical institutions as being God. Uh, it, 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 being able to see that these are human institutions that have a very particular history that is compromised and we have to critique it and we have to be able to confront it and f manage our way through that. Uh, because without confronting that, we're not gonna get toward unity. There's, there needs, at some point, there needs to be a reckoning and repentance and ownership by white evangelicals and white evangelical institutions about the sins and the damage that has been done. And because until that happens, you're not gonna actually see unity on a kind of a wide scale uh, beyond just, you know, nice interpersonal relationships at like a, a larger church, one body, you know, uh, one church level. So to me, I think we have to learn how to critique and question some of the authority that we've been taught is like, we, need, we just need to learn from. So I think that's a hard step that we gotta take, but I think without that, we're not gonna get, get toward the deeper level of unity. Yeah, I think uh, speaking uh, primarily about the evangelical context, I, I, think, I, think it, I think it's hard. Um, I think it may be difficult to um, make progress um, on some of these issues, especially, especially given the fact that um, you know, there aren't very many um, Asian Americans um, you know, in um, positions of power and leadership in evangelicalism in the United, in the United States specifically. Um, and so it makes it, I think, hard. I think that makes it hard to um, pursue racial justice, you know, and to um, fight for um, issues that are important, right, for Asian Americans. Um, so, yeah, I agree with a lot of, uh, you know, everything that's pretty much everything that's been said, you know, I think um, being able and open to um, critiquing, you know, perhaps some of the things that um, we have been taught, you know, perhaps, um, you know, being open to, um, yeah, even even critiquing some of the things that we learned in seminary, you know, or learn from our professors that we, um, you know, so esteemed, right? Um, I think, um, you know, just being united in this mission, you know, here's the word unity again, but, you know, being united in this mission um, to really, um, you know, affect change, to fight for what is right, you know, to pursue justice, to love others, um, to walk with God, you know, so. Some of my own journey, sorry, Ray, one of my own journey with that is, I know for a long time I struggled with wanting to be included in those conversations of unity and wanting to be invited and in, give my voice, and sometimes it just doesn't happen, and a lot of pain with that where God said, you know, stop waiting to be invited to a table, create your own table. You lead some of these conversations on biblical unity and that's what we've tried to do in Baltimore and really empower different voices together that we don't always have to wait to be able to share what we feel God's telling us to do, but let's start our own and invite others to that table. Yeah, that's good. And I think that's a part of what we're trying to do here and our hope is that you know we can really serve the church uh, through these endeavors and efforts um, mostly because you know I think the the big question that so many people seem to be asking is is transformation and is white evangelicalism salvageable is it something that will can can change uh, we've seen some Asian American leaders in some prominent positions uh, that uh, all of a sudden get pushed out and get uh, burned out or whatever happens. Uh, we also have seen Asian Americans that, you know, uh, we, all, we also see particular types of people that seem more palatable, get more embraced, and then people that uh, hold true to their ethnic and, and, uh, and even uh, uh, racial identities uh, get iced out and so um, that's probably another conversation for another time but really grateful uh, and, I, and I hope it continues to spark conversation but really grateful for the, the conversation that we've been able to have thank you for sharing and being with us at the table <laughs>